Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Career Insights 501. This is Dr. Loso. And today we have another special guest, Bob Thompson, and he is a real estate agent. He's going to talk to us today about um, real estate and a lot of other great things. So get ready for another great episode. Bob, welcome to the show. Welcome and thank you. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Bob. I saw on your um, profile that you said that you were an, an 80s child. So I'm an 80s baby. Um, so we probably have a lot of things in, in common. But um, just give the people a little background about yourself. Okay. Uh, like I said, my name is Bob Thompson. I am, of course, a real estate agent and have been for uh, well over 15 years now. I'm currently in the Hampton Roads, Virginia market, which is essentially Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Virginia area. Lots of military folks, things of that nature. I am definitely a child of the 80s, without a doubt. Any of the cheesy 80s movies I absolutely love and will watch over and over again. Um, interesting fun fact for me would be is I actually have an IMDb web page. I have a good friend of mine that has made movies through Maverick Films and some of his own stuff, uh, including Thanksgiving with the Carters 2 and Christmas with the Carters that came out in December. So I do these little, literally couldn't be more than four or five minute, you know, little mini roles for him in these movies that he makes. He basically makes these family comedies. I'm literally the token white guy in the movies. I have fun with it. It's just, hey, Bob, I need you to come do this part. Can you do it for me? I go and do it and have fun. So something silly like that. Oh, that's awesome. I, I think I've heard of those movies before. I'm going to have to. Are they on Netflix? They are on Amazon Prime. They're on okay. Tubi. They're on a bunch of the other ones. He's made, I think there's four four or five of the Carter's movies at this point. Okay. I'm going to have to watch one tonight, and I'm going to tag it wherever I find it. I'm going to tag it. I'm going to put the minute mark of wherever you're at in the um, movie, at least one of them, so people can, um, I don't get a chance to watch as much TV as I as I like, but so people can see you in, in action. That's pretty dope that you have an IMDb um, page. I'm always on there looking up actors and stuff, so I'm going to have to check you out on there. It's fun. I mean, it's it's. I have no delusions of the fact that I'm Tom Cruise or anything <laughs> like that, but it's fun to do. It's fun to meet new people. I think it's it's an example of, you never know where life is going to take you, and you always want to try to say yes and, and do right by people. And nine, nine out of ten times, they'll remember that, and then something will something fun will come up that you can take advantage of and at least say, okay, well, I did this this one time or two times, and it's something I'll always have a, you know, a good memory of. Yeah. I, I love that you said that. I talked to my mom about this a lot here recently because uh, my career, I had one of the – vendors that I work with at Discover, she was like, Carlos, you're one of them. She, no, she's like, you're the nicest, most available um, client that we work with. And I was just like, oh, I'm just, you know, being myself. <laughs> and so I, I've gotten a lot of opportunities through that vendor to go and speak at certain events and just, you know, networking with other people to um, do different things around ed tech and education. So it's been just a wonderful experience and just like you say just doing right by people um i think it'll take you in a lot of different places you didn't see your life or your career going just like you said and i don't think a lot of people um like think about that so i'm glad that you pointed that out i mean i i absolutely love it i i just think it's always important to for the most part say yes across the board on things and again you never know where where it's going to lead you and what's going to happen next. And, you know, we only, you know, we only get one time around this world and, you know, I've already mm -hmm. had a, a quadruple bypass and two heart attacks at 50. So, oh, you know, wow. I'm trying to enjoy myself while I can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you're doing good. Everything's good with your health now. Everything is pretty good. I mean, it's like anything else. It's, yeah. I have my good days and my bad days, but you know, we, we smile and keep on going. That's all we can do. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so tell us a little bit about your educational background. Well, for me, honestly enough, I, of course, you know, did the standard high school stuff. Um, 
somewhere along the way at about, I was in advanced classes growing up. I was short. I had glasses. I was the nerd personified all the way around. Literally the classic 80s nerd. I could have played that character. (laughs) And somewhere around my 15th and 16th year, I basically decided I didn't want to be the nerd anymore. anymore. I wanted to be the wild child, the bad kid. So I started to get into trouble. I did graduate. Honestly, the reason I got into real estate was when I was probably 31 or 32. At that point, I was a chemist. Uh, for a, a, I was working in the lab as a chemist for nine years. And somewhere around year six or seven, I had decided I wanted to go back to school. And I discovered from taking, you know, literally freshman chemistry and stuff like that, that I was bored and miserable out of my mind. I mean, I could do the work and I walked into freshman chemistry with my own lab coat, with my name on it, the whole nine yards. But it took that event to make me realize that this is not what I want to do. I don't want to be here for the next 40 years. And that's when I started looking into other you know avenues and opportunities and that's what kind of happened and how i ended up in real estate i can see this for me it seems like you have like a a lot of energy like a big energy and a a people person so is that is that kind of like a a part of it like you wanted to work more closely with people and not just be stuck in a lab hello this is bob thompson and you're listening to career insights 501 with dr loso Honestly, I got into real estate because I was, I had been at the, at that point, I had been in working in the lab at the chemical plant for probably six years or so. And I ended up staying a total of nine, but I discovered that I wasn't going to get any, I wasn't going to move up. I wasn't going to do any better. I would work. If I worked there for the next 40 years, it wouldn't have made a difference. I was going to make 45 grand a year, regardless of what I had going on. So I started looking into real estate and a couple of other things, and I actually ended up buying some rental property, and I found out that I was a much better agent than I was a landlord, and I enjoyed the hunt. I enjoyed working with people. I describe it as I got lucky. I fell into something that I'm absolutely good at, I'm passionate about, and I enjoy So then from that point on, I did it part-time for two years. I put my head down. I worked hard to get to the point where I could eventually leave, and that's what I did. I left the chemical plant in 2007 and went full-time into real estate. Let me ask you about about the type of people who do real estate because, like, what I'm hearing from you, it sounds like you got into to it or stayed into it or like really moved forward with it is because you liked helping people out um i feel like it's either like people are in it for the money or because they are genuinely trying like they feel like they're helping people out with you know purchasing their new home and that sort of thing um would you say that you fall in either one of those two categories or in some other category i believe i fall into i'm i'm extremely passionate about what i do I also like the fact that as an independent independent agent, I can come and go as I please and do what I want to do, and that's important to me. I think agents that are in it strictly for the money either don't last or it's so transparent that they don't get any repeat business. Most of my business is referral business because, again, you've done a good job for somebody. They refer you to other people. I think you have to care and you have to be passionate about this industry to do well and I think it shows in your referral business. And let me ask you this, because I see a lot of people on social media. And I know real estate is like a really great thing to get into to invest. But I see people on social media who, um, and, you know, with social media, you can be anything you want to be. But I, I guess they're like real estate agents and are successful. But it seems like they're trying to push everybody into um real estate and i feel like some of the messaging or some of the ways that it's presented with some people is that like you suck if you don't do real estate or or if you like aren't investing in real estate and i feel like one everything isn't for everybody and two there isn't enough like i guess property or inventory out there for just say if every american citizen wanted adult citizen wanted to get into real estate i don't really think that that's a feasible 
thing. And maybe I could be wrong. I don't really know how the housing inventory is in real estate, but I know there's, you know, businesses and apartment complexes and all that type of stuff. I think what it comes down to, and you're absolutely correct, a lot of agents push that narrative. I think the industry pushes the narrative. And I sometimes get in trouble for going from the opposite perspective. It is, it is not everybody is needs to be buying real estate right now, or you need to buy when you're ready to buy. There is no absolutely perfect time. Any A real estate agent, most real estate agents will tell you, well, it's always a good time to buy. That's not necessarily true. It depends on your current situation, depends on where you are in your life. If you're going to be staying in an area for only a couple of years, you buying real estate is kind of pointless, especially if it's something that Mm -hmm. you can't necessarily rent out or flip or whatever. I'll give you a good example. I got divorced in 20, my divorce was final in probably 2017. I moved into a duplex apartment because it was just me. That's all I needed. Now, four months after renting this place, it went up for sale. I could have bought it and bought it cheap. At the time, (coughs) excuse me, at the time, Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that. I just didn't want to mess with it. I wanted to focus on what I was doing, which was, you know, finishing up with the divorce and enjoying my single life, working and all of that. Now, as we look back, I probably should have bought that duplex. But at the time, it just, I, I, I had gotten through everything else. And I just didn't want to mess with it. I just, I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to make any major purchase. When I have folks that are, that are selling a property because they're divorcing, I tell them the same thing. Do not run out there and buy the first thing because you don't know what you want. You don't know what you need. There is nothing wrong with renting if it fits your situation. And that has never changed. And I think a lot of agents, unfortunately, push it the other way that you should always be buying or always doing whatever. And that's not always the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wanted to ask you just kind of like about getting into real estate as a, a profession. Um, real estate, the license, like to obtain a real estate license, it's different in every state. Is that correct? That is correct for the state test. The federal test is identical across all 50 states. The The biggest problem or the best problem is that it's fairly cheap to get into real estate and become a real estate agent. The problem with that is, of course, you have a lot of real estate agents and not a whole lot of them do, quite honestly, do a measurable amount of business. So you have a lot of part-time agents that, quite honestly, don't know what the heck they're doing and perpetuate Mm -hmm. certain myths or stereotypes or just don't understand how the process works. And you know, selling four deals, doing four deals a year doesn't make you a qualified agent in most markets. Now, obviously, if you're in a million dollar mm-hmm. plus market and you're only going to sell four or five houses, that's one thing. But that's not getting it done most of the time. And again, I get in trouble for that comment because year for years, you always had what I would call the stay at home agent. So you had a situation to where typically, and granted, this is 90s, 2000s, and may and certainly may not be the same now, but you had a lot of where the husband was the main breadwinner and the wife chose to do real estate and did four or five deals a, mo- a year and had lunch twice a month with Madge and had her little fun money and did her thing, but that didn't make them a competent real estate agent. You have a lot of agents mm-hmm. that will use the, and again, I hate to say it, but it's true, use the Christian or Jesus narrative to where, well, I'm a good Christian and I can help you buy a house and all of that. Mm. My, my real estate agent, when I bought my first house before I ever was a real estate agent acted that way, but only sold four houses a year and did a terrible job as my real estate agent. Like I went back and and checked it uh, off later on. And I was just like, this was awful. I never should have bought that house. But again, Mm-hmm. You don't always know. And I think I always try to tell my people or people in general, you know, interview an agent and find out how much business they're doing. And can you reach out to their, you know, their past referrals and, and things of that nature? That's some really good advice. I would have never thought about interviewing, you know, the agent or I was definitely like reaching out to their asking to be able to reach out to their past 
clients. Yeah, I mean, I should um, I should be able to hand you my phone with twenty five to thirty connections or or folks that you know contacts that I've worked with, and go okay, we're gonna sit right here, and then I'm gonna call them on the phone and go boom boom, and you know or look at the Facebook whatever you know LinkedIn whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. You know, dancing around your kitchen <laughs> doesn't make you a good real estate agent. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's some that's some great advice. <laughs> Another thing of, of, about the education part of real estate or becoming a real estate agent, what does that look like? So I knew when I was in Florida, I was doing like um, Ameritrade because I got fired from Enterprise. And I was like, oh, I need to find a job. So somebody was like, oh, you should be a real estate agent. And for me, it wasn't something that I think that I would actually want to be it I, I don't know it just didn't seem like it was my thing and so but I got the booklet and like it was this huge binder with all this information in it and I was just like whoa so um what what does it look like or how, how does that process work of at- obtaining a state license and what's the difference between the process of getting your state license and your um federal license well, essentially, obviously, the federal license is the same across the board. It really just comes down and, and you take your test for that and then you go back and take a state test. So, again, every state is different. Now, obviously, there is reciprocity between many states. Uh, as a matter of fact, Virginia has reciprocity with North Carolina, which gives me the advantage of getting a North Carolina license. And it gives me essentially two years to pass and take the North Carolina state test to make sure that I know all the rules for that. Once you get your initial license, every two years, you've got to take some continuing education, but it's not a massive amount. And most of the continuing education, quite honestly, a lot of it is just common sense. And it's just, okay, well, if you need to do this, you do this and A equals B and and we move forward from there. Again, the, the, the mark to get in my industry is not that high which means we have a lot of turnover and you have a lot of people that get their license and either don't use it. I mean, I've had many clients that have been like, well, yeah, I got my real estate license uh, five years ago in Michigan and I never used it. It happens all the time. Or investors will get their license simply because they feel like it gives them an edge in looking for property or negotiations or things of that nature. Um, It's Mm. not even so much about the education because most of that stuff can be backed up by paperwork and things of that nature. What a real estate agent should be doing is you need to know how to negotiate, you know, how to be able to put deals together. You have to be honest. And sometimes not everybody appreciates that. My job is to walk into your house and tell you what your house is worth. It's not made of gold. And a lot of times in cookie cutter neighborhoods, if every, if every house in that neighborhood has sold between 225 and 250. Guess what? Your house is worth between 225 and 250. I'm sorry that little Joey lived in one of the rooms and he's, you know, your favorite child, but that doesn't add value to the home. It just doesn't. And I always try to come mm-hmm. from that perspective. My attitude, and I've literally done this on real estate podcast. My attitude is I would rather you fire me before you hire me. Because I want you to know what Mm. we're dealing with. And and sometimes you just don't get along and you always, it always pays to be honest at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather, you know, exactly what I'm thinking and where I'm coming from than me lie to you, you know, tell you your house is worth 20 grand more. And then it sits on the market for a month and a half. That doesn't do anybody any good. And a lot of agents will do that Mm -hmm. to get business or they need business or whatever the case may be. And it's just not something that I choose to do. And I'm, you know, I'm come across very blunt and my style is not for everybody. Mm-hmm. So could you explain really quick what reciprocity is? Reciprocity is essentially, basically this, the states typically have most of the same rules. So it makes it easier to get a license in North Carolina since Virginia and North Carolina border each other. I can be in North Carolina inside of 45 minutes to an hour from where I'm at in Chesapeake. So it makes sense for me to get a North Carolina license, much like I believe Delaware has reciprocity with Maryland and 
Georgia has reciprocity with Florida because typically a lot of times your neighboring states will have reciprocity because they're making it easier for agents to get those licenses or they're ping-ponging back and forth between the two states depending on where business takes them. Like I have friends that live in mm. Northern Virginia and obviously Northern Virginia is right there with Maryland and right there with DC. So those are technically, those are three separate markets. So they typically will end up getting all three licenses so they can cover that whole area up there. So is it just one test and they have to apply for the other states or is it different? It's the, like, the national the test does not have to be retaken across the board. Typically like with North Carolina, that gives me two years. They give me the license, but it gives me two years to take the actual North Carolina test and take their classes. So they're basically giving me the mm -hmm. North Carolina license up front based on the fact that I've got, in my case, 15 plus years of Virginia license. I've never been in trouble. I've never, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to give you this North Carolina license. And it's obviously if you don't take those classes in the next two years, then you obviously you would lose that North Carolina license if you're not, you know, if you don't pass the test and all of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Me personally, I love your style that just the upfrontness and the, the bluntness. Um, <laughs> it's pretty much how I am. And a lot of people don't like it. I tell the people a lot of times that in corporate America, you know, I find myself stumbling over words trying to make things nice or like political and it's just kind of like I, I, I just want to say it like I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings but this is just the way that it is but so I definitely think that um people kind of make their house a a person or part of the family in a sense and that's why they have that attachment to it because they have all these memories and stuff there and they have more value attached to the house than you know me going in there looking to buy the house you know like if you got these pink walls and whatever floors like i might not want that in in the house but you think it's the greatest thing ever so do you run into that a lot? actually quite often uh a case in point would actually be my sister my sister and her husband had a conversation about two years ago about painting and they were at the time were planning on you know selling the house so they were starting to take care of some of the the small details that all homeowners, myself included, miss. You know, you don't necessarily, you know, fix things as fast as you should or the toilet's leaking so you'll get to it the following week or whatever. Little nickel and dime projects that a lot of us just don't quite get to in a timely fashion. And she wanted to paint the living room some sort of wild blue color or something. And she was like, all right, you're the decider on this. What do you think? Jason wants to do this and I want to do this. And I said, Jason's right. I said, you're selling the house. I said, if you paint it, you're going to have to paint it again in two years. You cannot put some crazy color on the wall. Otherwise, go with neutral, go with simple, go with white, bright, beige, whatever the case may be. Heck, you can go with a you know nice light blue, but you can't put some dark blue in the living room simply because you like it. And if you do that, you're going to have to repaint it. So that happens quite mm -hmm. often, and that's fine and dandy if you're staying in the property for a long time. You know, that's one thing. And it also depends on the property. If you've got a, an immaculate property all the way around and you've got gaudy paint, you're probably going to have to repaint. Or hope to God the agent on the other end understands that it's just paint and it can be replaced because not everybody realizes that. You typically find that with first-time home buyers, They will walk into a home and see you know, bad looking paint or ugly paint and don't understand that, okay, well, this house meets your criteria. It fits everything that you need. All you need to do is repaint it. So then once they get that picture in their head, then they can move forward, but it can definitely be a problem from time to time. This brings up like so many good things. So when you say like the first time um, home buyers or purchasers, it made me think of like the TV shows and <laughs> people walking there and they see the, the, the crazy things. But I wanted to ask you about so it's like two things. The first thing is, um, I don't want to get into the first question. Just spit Okay. It. So what are you, what are your thoughts on the TV shows? I, 
I feel like a lot of stuff is impossible or made for TV, and it's just, it doesn't really work out the way that they um, portray it. Most of those shows are fake, uh, just like anything else. Typically, they the people that are buying the house have already picked the house. They've already made a decision on it. It's like any other reality-based TV show, whether it's Real Housewives mm. of wherever or, whatever. you know, <laughs> listings to lit, to selling to blah, blah, blah. Most of that stuff, you got to take it all with a grain of salt. That's why they make parodies of it. You know, anything that's made a parody of is mm. probably for a good reason. Um, <laughs> again, I've actually at one point had been asked to possibly be on one of those shows because they were going to, they were talking about, doing one around here and since i i'm assuming since i didn't know the right people or didn't grease the right palm i was never on that show or whatever it was and they make so many of those to me those shows are silly most real estate agents won't even watch those shows i can't stand them just because they're just not real and i imagine you know most people that are in a certain profession probably don't watch those type of shows because you know like anything else they can pick them apart you know, yeah. I don't think firefighters yeah. are watching, you know, nine one should nine one one shows and stuff like that without going. Okay, that's not real. You know, it's funny you say that because I have a friend that's a firefighter, and I asked him if he watched it, and he's like, "I yeah. hate that show." <laughs> yeah, and that typically seems to be the case because again, it's they're all reality type shows, and you just have to take all of that with a grain of salt. Yeah. And, you know, I always found it funny. It's like, okay, they're going to show them there's three houses and they have to pick one of these houses. So, like, now you're saying that they had already picked it out and all that stuff makes a lot of sense because it's just kind of like they have this budget and they can only go over 50. It's just kind of, it's just like, okay, at first, you know, when I was younger and I watched the shows and I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is cool. But then I got older. I was like, this really just doesn't make sense. You know, just three houses and like they're just so different like they have the ideal house that they want and they tell them all the things that they want they just go pick out all these crazy ass houses that has nothing to do with their price range for one and then like their style or size and it's just kind of like what are these realtors thinking when they pick out these houses to show these people so definitely it's just the entertainment value of let's just show a crazy house because in a normal situation you're not going to do that if I've got a client that needs a first mm-hmm. floor bedroom, you know, primary bedroom, then I'm not going to show her two story houses because what would be the point? If 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 the bedroom mm-hmm. is upstairs, that defeats what she wants. So we ha- we can only we're only going to go look at properties that are you know have a primary bedroom downstairs. Another thing I wanted to have you talk a little bit about is the difference between, I guess, selling, and I don't know the correct terms for this, but you can correct me, just selling a home and then like flipping houses. Um, So I know real estate agents get in, like those are two big things that I see agents getting into, like buying houses and flipping them and then just the traditional like selling of um, houses. Well, for the most part, like I said, I work with a lot of investors. I, I, I work with a lot of foreclosure properties, short sales, uh, things of that nature. And of course, your standard buyer and seller. Investors are going to, it's the old school, buy low, sell high. That's all it is, um, which can be done in just about every market. It's just a matter of finding the right property to flip it, fix it up, and then put it back on the market which I think ultimately is a good thing because the average buyer can't afford to drop a hundred grand on a, on a property for cash because the house is beat up and won't get up, won't pass for a loan. So the investor gets in there, they buy the property cheap enough. And let's say the house after being rehabbed is worth two fifty, So they'll drop a hundred grand cash on it, spend 50 or 60 to fix it up and then turn around and flip it and make their money. And that's fair. They make their money. Contractors mm-hmm. that do the work make their money. At the end of the day, the brand new family gets a nice property that they can move into that's been hopefully been rehabbed correctly and move forward. Of course, you get the wholesalers and things of that nature that are also involved in that process. And, you know, it's an interesting thing because there's a chain there. It's a food chain to where everybody kind of has their hand in that pie when that property is flipped. But I think it's ultimately for the best nine out of 10 times 
because otherwise that property is just going to sit there. If you can't get a loan on it, most people can't buy it anyway without getting an FHA or a VA loan. And if it doesn't qualify, somebody's got to buy that property and flip it. Mm-hmm. Where do you see the housing market going? Right now. Just with all the craziness that's going on in the past couple of years. Well, I I think what it comes down to is you have pundits on both sides and you have everybody trying to make money off of that to where you have within real estate itself, you have folks that are saying, okay, well, we're getting ready to hit this big, massive recession and you need to diversify and you need to do this and do that. That's not the case. I, I don't believe that. And I went through the recession of 2007 and 2008. People were still buying property because they had enough inventory. We have no, we don't have any inventory. So prices are still strong. Yes, rates are up right now, but there's ways to deal with that. As you know, as well as I do, the government is quick to release and create new programs or just the banks and businesses themselves will create programs if they're needed. But at the end of the day, there's not enough inventory, at least, and, and every market is different. So like, you know, mm-hmm. they'll say, okay, well, the state of Virginia, we're in a recession or housing prices have come down, not in Hampton Roads. Prices have stabilized, of course, but we're mm-hmm. in a military community. So we always have people coming and going and buying. And if there's not enough inventory, then that's all that really matters. It doesn't make a difference. The houses are selling. Most of them are selling in a timely fashion. Because whether anybody likes it or not, folks are moving all the time. They just are. So I think mm-hmm. I don't believe that the you know the chicken little type of atmosphere to where everything is going to end. That's mm-hmm. it's a reason for people to write stories. You and I both know I can go on the internet right now and find fifteen stories that say we're going to have a massive recession tomorrow, and I can also look at fifteen stories that say the other thing. It's you know. Go mm-hmm. through any go through your spam email and you'll get one that says Trump is the devil. You'll get one that says Biden is the devil. And they're all twisting the same facts and figures any which way they want to. Or they'll pull out, you know, yeah. something stupid Biden said 15 years ago or something stupid Trump said 15 years ago. You can manipulate that data 15 different ways to Sunday, depending on what you're trying to accomplish at the time. Mm-hmm. I agree 100 percent on that. I just bought a. Uh... Not just bought it. I had it for a while now, but it, um, how to make statistics say or lie or something like that. Some book they got, but yeah, they can definitely twist the the data around to make it say whatever they want to say. <clears throat> um, dang it, I was gonna ask you something else. Like it's so much <laughs> stuff that I'm, <laughs> I want to actually like I'm trying to stay on like one in one area before I jump somewhere else oh about the programs you had mentioned about they can create programs because didn't bank of america just create a program for like african americans or minorities or something like that i think for um for real estate i think they just created a a program but um yes they have a new they have a new program coming out um in most in a lot of cities there are first-time home buyer programs available there's programs for teachers police officers firefighters, things of that nature. In the past, when we did have the recession in 2007 and 2008, they were creating down payment assistance programs that were completely legal. And that was, a, that was helpful also, or they were doing grants to where they, they had down payment assistant grants to where if you lived in the house for a certain number of years, you didn't have to pay that grant back. So as is typical, mm. when there's a vacuum, Big government and big business are going to step in to try to fill that role. And I think they learned from the last recession that whether anybody likes it or not, real estate and the purchasing of homes and buying and selling of homes turns a lot of wheels. And there's a lot of market. There's a lot of things that are affected by that. If houses aren't selling, then contractors aren't working, then people that are related to that organization in terms of title companies and the cleaning ladies and the cleaning crews and the clean out people and things of that, all of those types of people suffer much like if, if I own a hotel chain and nobody's renting rooms, then all of my people below me are hurting 
you know, the, the cook that can't come in because we're in the middle of COVID, the housekeeper that's not working because nobody's running hotel rooms, you know, that loss of income mm-hmm. is affected up one end and down the other. So you talked about the, these programs, um, and I didn't know about the ones for teachers and police officers, so I think those are great. But did you talk about the FHA program? I think that's a big one that people talk about a lot, but maybe not know that much about, or maybe it's a lot of this, I don't want to say disinformation, but wrong information or not totally correct information. Could you talk or tell people a little of course, bit about that. Of course, the original program. FHA program typically means that any home buyer has to put three and a half percent down on the property. So, regardless of whatever you're approved for, that's where you're at. Is three? You've got to put a minimum of three and a half percent down. Obviously, there's closing costs, which hopefully you can get from the seller from time to time. Now, there's variations on that program. There is your VHDA program, which is no money down, because essentially the down payment is put into a secondary loan that the government is backing. These are government-backed loans. In addition to that, you have a, 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 uh, there's a rural loan you can use for rural communities that do the same thing, and the name escapes me all of a sudden. I don't know why my brain froze on the name of it. Um, So you have the VHDA, USDA, there we go, sorry, the USDA. And then, of course, you have your VA program, which, of course, is for your military folks. That, again, is a no money down program. You still got to pay your closing costs, but a lot of times you can get that that closing cost either from the seller or perhaps get a uh, a grant or uh, even get a, essentially, you can get a gift from a family member. So there's a lot of ways to do that. And and mortgage companies have gotten smart and they've created additional programs and there's ways to tie all of that in to get into a property fairly cheap overall compared to 40 years mm-hmm. ago when my parents, you know, they had to save up 20 percent or whatever the case may be before they could do anything. Yeah, because I know I, I remember hearing about that people having to like save that 20 percent or, you know. I would even hear people say like 10% and you would think about how much that would be on the price of, you know, some of these homes. And it's just kind of like hard to save that money up, which brings me to my next question. Is there some sort of advice that you could give to people who are staying in an apartment and um, want to get a house? But so, for example, like for me, I pay like almost $2,000 a month for rent in my two bedroom apartment. So I tell people that and it's like, damn, that's more than my mortgage on my new house. So, but it's hard to like save up money to, um, I guess I have to put on that down payment. But with a lot of those programs you just named, um, you know, like the three, three and a half percent down is not as hard, but what are some tips or advice that you could give to um, renters that want to make that transition and buy and purchase a home and how they could save and um, get that process. My first opinion would be, and this is what I tell everybody. I actually had this conversation. I have a teacher friend of mine that reached out to me today, as a matter of fact, to ask that question. Um, Talk to a mortgage person, figure out, you know, what you need to do and where you stand. So that's the biggest thing is knowing where you stand. So let's say your credit score is, 750 and you're in great shape, but maybe you don't make enough money. So you only qualify for a certain amount. At least you'll know where you stand. So even if you're not ready to purchase right now, that gives you some guidelines to go, okay, in the next six months, um, Joe Mortgage is telling me I need to save 15, you know, $10,000 because I'm going to have to put three and a half percent down. He's also told me that I can save that money in several different ways. There's this program that will match it, or um, I'm in a situation where I can perhaps get a gift from my family members and that's legal. I can do it that way or, you know, get that money transferred over. I could pull that money from my 401k, depending where I am. The other thing I would say that even if you get prepared, it may not be the best time for you to buy and it may be, and it's okay to rent if it fits your needs and your lifestyle. If you're 
gone 24 seven, then why would you buy a house like a single family home where you've got to do maintenance and all of this other stuff if you're not going to be home? Now, if you're buying a condo or some sort of townhouse where most of that maintenance is included in your price point, that's different. If you're going to be long term within that community, that's different. Typically, you know, we get a lot of military folks come through here. And I've all my rule of thumb has always been do not buy anything if you're only going to be here for three years unless your intention is to be a landlord. So if you're deliberately buying something relatively inexpensive because you know I'm leaving in three years and I'm going to rent this thing out and this is what I want to do. But don't spend all of your money to the top of your price point to live here for three years because if, God forbid, the market does shift, what are you going to do with a property that you can't sell and you can't rent it out for what you owe on the mortgage? which is where short sales and things of that nature come into play and it can hurt you. Remember, whether anybody likes it or not, most of us are, you know, several paychecks or a job loss or divorce from losing our home. And that's typically why people lose their home is those two reasons right there, divorce, Mm -hmm. you know, and or job loss. So just, you want to be prepared. It's always, and number one, it's always good to know your credit score and know your numbers and figure out, well, what do I need to do to fix my credit? If I have, you know, bad credit or blemishes on it, there's many ways to fix it. And no, you don't have to pay some expensive credit repair company to do that. A lot of it is just common sense and you can, you know, read up on it and do it that way. And even well-to-do people, I've had doctors that forgot they didn't pay a gas bill 10 years ago when it was on their credit report. And it couldn't have been more than 150 bucks. And they're like, oh, good Lord, I don't remember that being on there. You know, when I bought my house, when we first started to to purchase our first home, my ex-wife and I, I literally owed money to Montgomery Ward on a credit card and they didn't even exist anymore. I had to find the company that had bought the debt and ask them to send me the bill so I could make payments on it. Because... Again, I owed my, you know, Montgomery Ward went out of business. I owed, still owed this money. It was on my credit report and I had to pay it. So I had to make, I think I made $50 or hundred dollar payments for like five months. And then, you know, the debt was gone and that was the end of it. But I literally had to track down who owned that debt. Cause again, it had been, you know, debt gets mm-hmm. bought and purchased, you know, sometimes on multiple occasions. Yeah. You know, I like you, Bob. You gave a really, I feel like your answers are very balanced and not biased because I feel like if I had asked some other people that it would be like, well, buying is better than renting anyway. And some people say, well, renting is, like I see that a lot of times, like there's people that that don't look at the nuances of a person's situation. They just say, oh, you should be renting or, oh, you should be buying a home because the mortgage is typically cheaper with a lot of the rent prices that I've been paying. <laughs> um, so I, I like how you gave like these different scenarios and situations and told why one is better than the other. So no problem. And again, everybody's that. situation is different. You know, this, this teacher that I spoke to tonight is still living at home. So she's not really necessarily ready to buy right now. But like I told her, go talk to my mortgage guy get, you know, not even necessarily get completely pre-approved, but know what your, at the end of the day, know what your numbers are. Um, There's Mm -hmm. a lot of folks that are, especially in the gig economy to where maybe they get cash. Okay. Well, you've got to, you're going to, whether you want to or not, you're going to have to track that money. So you know exactly what you're making every month. So if you're getting, let's be honest, I've actually worked with entertainers, Dancers will call them whatever you whatever the politically correct term for that is, though. Uh, I've worked with dancers to where they were, you know, they made. Oh, yes. I'm slow. OK, so they I got made you now. more than enough <laughs> income, but they didn't have it documented. So they had to start documenting that income. Mm. And that's just a simple matter of, OK, well, I made. Eight hundred dollars this week and I got to go deposit it in the bank and then I got to pay taxes on it and I got to do all of this. So I can keep track of it. And they were able to purchase a home because they could prove they made that money. And nowadays you have all sorts Mm -hmm. of weird loans you can get. They have no doc loans. They have all, you know, you name it. There's probably a loan program out there, 
you know, depending on what your credit score is and of course, you know, stuff like that. But there is, everybody's situation is different and it's not always the best time to buy. Yes, rental prices are going to continue to go mm-hmm. up. That's not going to change. If there's no inventory, then you don't have any choice in the matter. You're going to pay a higher rent. But yeah. sometimes peace of mind is worth that knowing full well that my situation is going to be changing in six months to a year. Or, okay, if I'm single and go buy a property, what if I meet somebody down the line and they want to move out of the area or we start having children and then the house is too small or, you know, it could be any number of things. If I'm, again, Mm -hmm. if I'm, my most normal example would be the military. If you're only going to be stationed someplace for two years, why would you buy something? If it was me, I would take my, my housing allowance and rent the most nicest thing I could possibly find at the top of the mark, you know, and live like a king in a really yeah. fancy rental property for two years and then move on to my next duty station, you know, until I could maybe buy something reasonable or if I waited and got to the end and then used my, then went ahead and bought something. Hmm. Um, so I wanted to ask you, we talked a little bit earlier about the, cause I know we kind of at our time and no, I'm good. Busy, I'm busy good. Night. No worries. But I want, okay. Okay. Um, but I did want you to get into the, like, life isn't over at, after you get into your, your thirties. <laughs> um, you had mentioned that. And so I'll just let you have, you know, open mic and you can just riff and talk about whatever you want to. I I think for me, and again, part of this is being 50 years old and looking back when I never, and I know it's a cliche, I never thought I would make it to 50. It didn't really, you know, you kind of go through life and you don't really think about, you know, all the time where you're going next. I think it's important for people to understand that you can change your destination. And I'm an example of that simply from the fact that I did, you know, I worked nine years at the chemical plant and was able to transition into real estate and be successful with it. And I think there's a lot of naysayers and there's a lot of people that say, okay, well, you can't do this and you can't do that. You're always going to find that. You know, when I went from working in the grocery store as a frozen food dairy manager at a grocery chain and then worked and then got the job at the chemical plant, I had people at the grocery store, I was making $9 an hour. And they're going, you're never going to make any more money. Why would you want to leave? That You've got this great job at the grocery store. We were going to put you in the management program. And then you transition into the chemical plant. You work in the lab. You do your years. And then when you decide to go full-time in real estate, I literally had supervisors and other people. You know, why would you leave right now? There's a recession going on. You're never going to make more than any, more, any more money than you currently are right now. And within a year of that, I was I had doubled my income and kept moving forward and found what I needed to be doing. And I think I, I see it a lot with the young people that they just feel like, OK, well, this is where I am and this is where I'm stuck. And that's not the case. Nobody is ever stuck. We're we're stuck by our own thought process. And I think imposter mm-hmm. syndrome has a lot to do with that. And I'm just as guilty of that as anybody else is. You know, we never, I mean, I've done quotes in major newspapers. I've done real estate podcasts. I've done this and that. And there's always at least once a month or so when things start to get slow, it could even just be a day where like, okay, everything is wrapped up or is in a holding pattern because we're getting ready to close on these four properties and this properties aren't going on the market till next week. And you have that one slow day. And in the back of my head, I'll go, well, that's it. I'm done. I'm never selling another house again. Now, I can look back through the last 15 years and know that that's silly, but that feeling never completely leaves. It just doesn't. And you just have to push that aside and keep going. You know, you've got to be willing to reach out and talk to people and make those changes that you need to make. Again, some folks, I've got friends of mine that are perfectly happy mowing the lawn on Saturday and living their life. And that's the way they want to live their life. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. And there's a lot of people that want more than that, or they want to transition and change and move into something. It takes hard work, but you've got to be willing to reach out and and almost kind of put that into the ether 
And the beautiful thing now, when I was growing up, we didn't have the internet. So I, my, your circle was very, very small. Now I can, I'm actually in the middle of working on a, a, a blog and a, and a, and a uh, ebook for this, that now I can go on the internet right now and I can find 40, 50, 60 people that are backing me up that have the same passion for whatever I'm doing, or at least can, you know, we can feed off of each other and say, Hey, you can do this, or let me see what you're working on. Hey, great. Maybe you should tweak it this way to where when I was 25, my world was very, very small as well. It would have been, I typically, I was a typical suburban male for all intents and purposes. I went to high school from first grade through 12 through the same school. I had a lot of the same friends that I grew up with. I knew, you know, to this day, I could walk into my local watering hole and probably a half a dozen people I'll know that I've known since high school, right, wrong, or otherwise. So your your circle mm-hmm. is was small. Now I can go on the internet and I can learn about all sorts of things that, I, that you may pique my interest. Even if they only pique it for 10 minutes, I may find out, you know what, this isn't for me. So I'm going to keep going, but I can find my tribe online if I can't find them locally, because there's always going to be naysayers. There's always going to be even people in our own family that are going to see us a certain way. And sometimes we see ourselves that way. And I think it's easier to do that when you're younger. When you get older, you kind of get to a certain point where you just don't give a crap anymore, you know, and that's kind of where I am. It's Mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, like me, don't like me don't really care. Just doesn't affect me either way. I can walk into a room, yeah. talk to everybody in the room and somebody wants to give me a bad attitude or whatever. That's on you, pal. I don't, I don't have time for that. You know, and my days of swinging on somebody are gone. You know, I'm, I'm not a young, I'm not a young man anymore. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, <laughs> you've got to be willing to put yourself out there and you can do that, get the encouragement that you need online and then put it into practice in real life. And that's what I think a lot of young people are struggling with. Like you and I talked about earlier, going to the bank and God forbid you talk to a human being. Um, If you're getting poor service, you know, not being a Karen about it, but sometimes you've got to, Hey, you know, this is wrong and it's got to be fixed, especially if it's something that's expensive or Mm -hmm. something that was, you know, particularly important to you. Again, I have family members that will still oh, that will always see me as the silly kid with wild dreams that, you know, wasn't very mature as a child. That's not going to change. Why would it change? They don't see me enough for it to make a difference in my world. And that's OK. Other people may see me, you know, as a responsible citizen or I've got friends of mine that we used to get hammered drunk together when we were in our 20s and we can look at each other. And go, I can't believe I'm taking real estate advice from Bob Thompson, the same guy that drank 18 beers one (laughs) night and passed out, you know, because you have those type of relationships with certain people. So it's it's interesting as you get older to see the transition of people. And there's always opportunities to change and grow. And I think a lot of people miss those opportunities. Mm -hmm. I like the last part that you just talked about, because that's something that I I think I've I think I know that I've had to, I guess, come to grasp with over the past few years is the way that people perceive me. So like a wisecrack joking. And then I say things that I'm trying to be serious, people don't really see me in that light. And I'm like, guys, I spent 13 years in college. I have a master's, a PhD. I've worked for all these big companies. And so I'm not just talking out of my ass when I say a lot of things. And But a lot of people would just like their perception of you um, stops or it's just this one thing. And I, and for me, it's so frustrating because I don't think that I'm just this two dimensional person, so to speak. I think I'm like a three dimensional, like there's all these different sides to me, but people can only see like, like what's facing for like this one, one side of me. So like you, as I've gotten older, it's just kind of like, okay, I don't care. Like I, I'm not even going to put any energy or, time or thought into that or try to figure it out or make you not make you but help you understand it and it's just kind of like it is what it is again like you said I don't spend a lot of time 
around those people to like really care or try to put forth the effort, you know. Yeah, and to get people are going to think what change. they're going to think, and and we all, whether we whether we want to admit it or not, we all stereotype to a certain extent, depending on where we are or how comfortable mm-hmm. we are in a particular place or location. And that works both ways. I've seen it. I've had it done to me and I'm sure I've done it to other people. It's just a part of who we are, whether we like it or not. We have a tendency to, to go that direction. And I also think people can see phoniness too. Um, I don't, when I'm doing real estate, I'm not suit and tie guy. I'm typically jeans, maybe a polo shirt if I'm lucky, but a lot of times it's just, especially if it's a referral, I'm just going to do, do who I am. Um, if you look at my Facebook, um, it's going to be a mix of real estate and just silliness and stupidity. You know, Hey, this is something fun that I post, Mm -hmm. or I have a tendency I'll post like, uh, like a leisure suit ad from the seventies and be like, guys, I'm gonna wear this for my next appointment. What do you think? You know, gets a little chuckle, um, you know, or whatever's going on in my world, I'll post, you know, a, a good, it's again, it's a whip. It's a mix of a little bit of business, a little bit of fun, always my personality. It's not going to always be, this is what the market is doing and you should be buying right now and blah, 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 blah. Everybody has, we all have perceptions and you just have to accept that fact that you're not going to necessarily change those opinions. And if people took the time to talk to you or, or mm-hmm. listen to your open your mouth, you'd be amazed, you know, how maybe their perceptions will change, you know, and it, it just, you know, you mm-hmm. hope folks are open minded enough, but that's not always the case and it's not going to be. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent true. I wanted to get into our pre recording conversation about, um, just, I guess, the younger generation and, you know, not being in the moment in critical or, um, you know, once in a lifetime moments or, you know, situations and um, just making sure that they're taking advantage of those opportunities. Um, you, you shared a story. You don't have to talk about that story in particular if you don't want to, but I would like for you to just talk about um, to the to the younger listeners or even the older listeners or people who just aren't really present and um, just talk about the importance of, of that. Well, I would probably bring up that story because I think it's an important okay. story. So I have a friend of mine, Brian Thompson, that uh, makes movies and things of that nature and also runs Miami Web Fest. I was down there with him in 2021, just kind of helping out a little bit at Jack of all trades, helping out with whatever. So we're down there and we've got, you know, directors that are down there. They're, you know, we've got documentarians, we've got lawyers, we've got um, kind of the cream of the crop of Miami when it comes to movies and, and TVs and things of that nature. Um, DJ EFN is down there. He's with the Drunk Champs podcast. So we've got all of these important people down there. We did a pre-event at a restaurant, a closed event at a restaurant. We have probably about 11 or 12 interns that are local, you know, movie interns that are going currently going to film school. So this is an opportunity for them to meet and greet and talk about what their projects are and get to know some of these, the top flight people. So we go to the event. There again, not not a whole lot of people. It's a closed event, and we've encouraged the interns to talk to everybody, introduce yourselves. If you've got business cards, hand them out. You know, get them. Try to connect on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, whatever Instagram, whatever the case may be. And I look over in the corner, and there's probably four or five of the interns that are sitting there playing on their phone and talking to each other. And they're not doing anything at all. And I couldn't believe it. And I even went over there. I was like, guys, you're here. You know, I will be happy to introduce you to so-and-so. Brian said the same thing. Hey, guys, you want to meet somebody? Let me know. I'll introduce you. And those guys, they never left their phones. They sat there the whole night on their phones or talking to each other. And it's like, you might as well have just stayed home. You It served you no purpose whatsoever. And that's the type of stuff that you miss those opportunities. You've got to be willing to reach out and say hello. And if 
it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. That's fine and dandy, but at least you know that you tried and you have no idea how the the silliest, simplest thing can make a difference. Or you've got to, you at worst case, create a great story and a great memory. And in the other side of that is you, it may lead to something important. You just never know, you know? And I think yeah. a lot of people in general and young people specifically don't know how to interact or they lose those opportunities because they're either don't know what to say or embarrassed or whatever. And my attitude is always be yourself and go with that feeling, you know, walk up to that individual and be like, Hey, I don't, I, you know, I'm a little uh, hesitant, but I just wanted you to know that I, I, I admire your work and I wanted to ask you some questions. Worst case, if they're a jerk, they're a jerk and you keep on moving. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's that, I guess nothing ventured, nothing gained sort of, deal with that because um you know they're not putting themselves out there so they're not increasing the probability of them getting those opportunities uh, uh, the cell phone thing is just crazy <laughs> to me though you know how they can be so glued to their cell phones like i see people literally just like walk in the middle of the street and don't look for traffic and they walk in front of a car and the car blows at them and they get mad at the person in the car because they weren't looking. Yeah, so and they won't it's... go into the bank to ask a question or again, it's kind of like, okay, well, I don't want if I walk into a restaurant, I feel everybody's looking at me. Okay, well that's a that's it's okay to have that feeling, but the fact is ain't nobody looking at you. Nobody cares. <laughs> it's the guy that gets on the airplane and you know has to use his phone. Ninety five percent of us are not that important. We're just not. Yeah. They ain't nothing that can't wait an hour for us to get to. I mean, unless you're a heart surgeon or something like that, for the most part, myself included, ain't nobody that important. We're just, we're just not yeah. across the board. I don't, yeah. you know, yeah. and I think we get wrapped into that. And if that person's a jerk, they're not going to remember you anyway. So what difference does it make? It, you know, True. it just doesn't. So you have to try. And I think you have to, make that effort. And that's really what I've been pushing is that persistent progress and your life is not over at 30 and every opportunity can lead to something magical. Even it's for, if for 10 or 15 minutes, um, case in point, you know, I played in a heavy metal band when I was like 23, 24, 25, we never broke through. We got on the radio, we put a CD out. I got to play in front of people. Yes. It was minor league as it can be. And the band blew up doesn't make a difference. I have some great memories and I'll always have those memories. I got to hear my song, me singing on the radio. I've done, you know, as we talked about, I've been in, you know, three or four different movies, even in just bit parts. I still have that, you know, my IMDB webpage is always going to be there till the end of time. You'll be able to see my smiling face on a movie or a TV somewhere along the way. It's for five minutes. Who cares? I got to do it. I got to meet some incredible people and it was fun. And those opportunities can lead to other opportunities. But at worst case, they make for some cool stories and it's always a fond memory. Yeah. And, you know, at least maybe you felt like a rock star up there on, on stage, you know, even if it was a, a small crowd, like for a lot of people that's a big deal because they don't even get the opportunity to do that to get in front of people and you know perform or hear their self on the radio i know it may not be quite the same now because you can just like me get a mic and stream something to hear myself playing on whatever you know back then when things were a little bit more restricted and you know you had to go through all these different channels and people to to do that thing those things but um i, I definitely like that putting yourself out there and just trying different things and not giving up you know at a certain be it 30 or 40 you know i see the things online about how like like the k the colonel started kfc at this age and like all these different people who are successful like in their 40s and 50s and they started their businesses these big huge businesses or companies that everybody know um you know around the world when they were past you know over the hill so to speak so that's definitely, I think, um, something very important. And 
I, I talk a lot about reskilling and upskilling on this podcast and, you know, just at work in my everyday life, in my professional life, because I think the world changes so fast now that you have to be nimble and you have to be, have that growth mindset, you know, that mindset to be willing to say that, hey, I can learn something new or I should try something new because I don't really like this or maybe this is better or I just, you know, want to try something else out. Yeah, and most people that are quote unquote famous or successful didn't start out that way. You know, now granted, some folks automatically have an upper hand and sometimes their mm-hmm. success changes them. But at the initial beginning of that, you know, whether anybody likes it or not or thinks much of Jeff Bezos and Amazon, the man literally started a book business and they told him he was insane. Now, granted, Amazon is massive and, and again, I don't know what the man's like, and I haven't had that level of money or success to to know if I've changed. I certainly would be nice to find out, and I'm okay with that, you know. But we yeah. don't. But I don't know. <laughs> um, Robert Johnson started BET many many years ago when it was you know five UFC channels or UF UFH channels, and moved forward from there, and it became this massive conglomerate pre cable pre all of that, and it built up and it built up, and then. He eventually sold it. We only see the success portion of it. We don't see the day-to-day stuff that goes into the normal, everyday person that, you know, decides they have an idea and they are able to pursue it and get successful at it. And it may take years later. We don't see any of that hard work and effort. We just don't. And so we make assumptions. But somebody told them no, and they refused to listen and move forward anyway. And you froze. Yeah. I can hear you. Um, so the audio is, is freezing again on my end. I'm going to. Yeah, it's definitely an it audio up. issue. I'm, can I'm you hear me? I have you back on here because this has been a really great conversation, but I really just don't know what's up with the internet here today. And I think it might be something gone my end but i do want to just get into the little um what i like to call now lighten up and it's just more of a carefree um part of the show that i ask the guests some questions play would you rather and ask them just some more like little leisurely type questions so the first question that i ask you is what type of music do you listen to when um you're riding around to meet your clients or when you're just chilling out at the house (laughs) I am all over the place. I am an old school hip hop guy. I'm an old school metal head. I'm an old school country guy. Most of the new rap, I cannot absolutely cannot stand too much mumbling, too much. Woe is me too much non, you know, there's, there's no flow. There's no lyrical flow to 90% of it. Yes. I'm old. I I, I'm fine with that. I don't care about your little liachis, your little Uzi verts, your little this and your little vats. <laughs> Don't care. You mumble in, you're talking about Percocets and Xantex and all this other stuff. Uh, I, it's a mess. I have no, I'm, oh, and I old school, I'm cool mode old school. I'm public enemy old school. You know, I'm the, the mm. I'm the guy that can, you know, rap Wu Tang Clan's mystery of chess boxing from beginning to end. You know, maybe not very well, but I literally know it from lyric to lyric. Um, yeah. And I'm a, I'm always across the board. If I'm working at home, most of the time it's going to be typically some some old school metal or, or something heavy. Um, if I'm writing or working on a project, it's going to be something really mellow because I don't I want the background noise to be fairly low. If I'm in the car, typically it's going to be, quite honestly, it's going to be Rock the Bells Radio on Sirius XM because they play the old school hip hop Mm. or, you know, whatever I'm in the mood to listen to that day. I, if you go through my playlist for the, like the last two days, it literally switched back and forth from Cool Mo D to Minor Threat to John Denver and in between all over the place. Always has been. Nice, nice, nice. 
Okay, so I, I, I'm going to play this or would you rather, but it's going to be a hybrid, this or that and would you rather because, um, you know, with you being a, a child of the 80s, I wanted to get some 80s questions in there. So the first one is Atari or the Jaguar? Atari, always. <laughs> I saw the t-shirt, so I had to, <laughs> like, throw that one in there. Um, Ghostbusters or E.T.? E.T. He said, these are too easy. Um, the Breakfast Club or Ferris Bueller's Day Off? The Breakfast Club, only because I was the nerd character at that time. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask you two of these. Would you rather? These aren't really that good. Okay, so would you rather be forced to eat only spicy food or be forced to eat only incredibly bland food? It would have to be incredibly bland food because I am a sissy when it comes to spicy, spicy food. I'll be completely <laughs> honest. I always have been. I just I could never be on like that hot wing show. No way in the world. I, I would oh, just explode. Yeah. I'd explode right there on camera and die. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, <laughs> would you rather never be able to eat meat again or never be able to eat vegetables? I hate vegetables. So I'm all, <laughs> I'm all about a steak, a burger, macaroni and cheese. Don't give me no salad. I'm, I'm granted I'm fat as it is right now, but that's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about a steak. I, I got to try to find somewhere that's still open that I can go and grab a steak from tonight because i'm tired of eating tacos <laughs> and all this like grilled chicken i need some real meat um i know i said two but i actually one more would you rather be blind or see spirits everywhere you go i would rather see spirits and that's because i wore glasses for many years so i felt like i was blind for a long time <laughs> yeah i had lazy context now I guess it's been five or six years ago. Smartest thing I ever did. Mm, I've been considering it. So. I don't. I don't miss contacts. I, I don't miss contacts. waking up not being able to see. I, I should have done it years before, and it's so cheap now to do it. It's mm. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to invest in in that because the contacts get on my nerve, and then glasses. Are cool but sometimes when i'm laying down you know trying to watch tv or whatever they get all annoying and like jack up or whatever so i uh, just like i need to check this lasik out i did want to ask you though how old were you when you first got into real estate like in your mid-30s i made the transition when i was 35 so i got into okay. real estate about 32 and 32 33 we had a three-year plan basically to where i was going to build up my real estate business. We were going to pay off debt. We were going to do this, that type of stuff. And that three-year plan, I'm happy and proud to say that only took two years because I worked my butt off. We did what we needed to do, my ex-wife and I, and I was able to walk out of that real estate, uh, out of that chemical plant in April of 2007, a year before I needed to. At 35. Nice. And up until that point, I okay. always worked two yeah. jobs, whether it was the chemical plant and selling stuff on eBay or doing some sort of side hustle, uh, the chemical plant and real estate. I never only had one job until I went to real estate full time. Hmm. That's a lot. Two jobs is a lot. <laughs> I took it had to be done out. and I, to get where I needed to go. I worked, you know, and I worked 12 hour shifts at the chemical plant. So I worked a lot of night shifts so I could do paperwork while I was there because I had some downtime and mm -hmm. then I would show property during the day. So sometimes I didn't get a whole lot of sleep, but it's where I wanted to be. So I had to do it. Um, what are some things that you do for self-care or self-care practices that you take part in? Naps. 
<laughs> I feel you 100 percent on that one. Because of I the, the, the quadruple bypass and the heart attacks and all of that, I have learned that if my body tells me to take a nap, I'll go take a nap. Whether it's a 30 minute nap in the morning mm-hmm. or if I hit a wall at 3 30 or 4 o'clock, I'll take a nap. If I know I'm gonna have a full you know, a full day of stuff or a later than normal day like tonight, then I'll go and take mm-hmm. a nap or at least attempt to take a nap. Just quiet down and 20, 30 minutes ain't nothing that important. Again, they yeah. can't wait, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think you have a good point. It's important to listen to your body. So I always ask everybody about the self um, care thing. And I think just people get so caught up in the grind and the rat race that they don't listen to their bodies and, you know, in a sense, work themselves, not to death, but to the bone, um, I guess is more of an appropriate term. Um, But yeah, just listening to your body. And that's something that I like a lot of times my body's telling me, okay, just like you say, take a nap, go to sleep, stop working, stop thinking about things, um, because right now I'm just not like thinking clearly or you know i'm not at my peak performance and so that's something that i had to start doing myself is just saying okay let me stop and go literally it's just like you take a nap because i know when i wake up that i could perform a lot better than just you know trying to push through. yeah or you spend 30 or 45 minutes goofing off on the phone which does no good so you're only mm-hmm. at half capacity anyway you might as well just go ahead and shut it down for 30 minutes yeah and do it the right way then that's what i've learned Mm -hmm. because otherwise if i'm exhausted or tired i'm only halfway doing it anyway you know that as well as i do it's just there's no i'd rather just Mm -hmm. okay we're unplugging turn the phone down go take your nap and then come back up Mm -hmm. you're fresher you're ready to go back to work yeah so is there anything else that you want to leave the listeners with before we get out of here um You know, like I said, uh, again, my biggest thing is I think you can, you know, create anything that you want to create and do and take take opportunities when they come to you. Uh, I always try to never say no to stuff because you never know what's Mm going to happen. They can always reach out to me, you know, Bob the Agent on LinkedIn, you know, shameless plug, Bob the Agent on Facebook. Um, They can, I'm sure you'll have that information on there. They can send me an email. Hell, they can even give me a phone call. I'm one of those weird people that actually answers their phone or will answer a text quickly. That's kind of my thing is like when I, as an agent, Mm -hmm. it's important to do that. Um, Like I said, I'm just, you know, I've had probably three or four major, what I would say major career changes. And I think you're going to continue to see that pattern. And I think at the end of the day, you know, you only get one shot at this. It sounds cliche and it's, you know, kind of silly, but it's right, wrong or otherwise. It's true. I, I just, you know, you can oh you always got to try to reach out and do and do different things and do fun things i think mhm no i was going to give you the opportunity to like plug all your stuff so you're perfectly fine now do, don't you have a podcast yourself or was that somebody's podcast that i saw that i've been featured on a bunch of different oh, okay. podcasts i don't have a podcast of my own um okay probably because i'm lazy or because i don't know if i you know i i like I enjoy doing the podcast. I've done a lot of real estate podcasts. I'm branching into um, coaching and self-help podcast. I actually did a podcast, speaking of 80s, on Grease 2, the movie, which is one of my all-time favorite guilty pleasures of my childhood is that stupid movie. Even as awful (laughs) as it is, um, I got to do that. Um, So just, you know, again, it's, you know, opportunities come up and you and you raise your hand and you get to do something that maybe you know other than my sister nobody else i know is a fan of grease 2 the movie but it was fun to do the mm-hmm. podcast and talk with the with the host about it and, and my sister enjoyed it and that's really all that matters at the end of the day you know i as long as i'm having fun i'm not too worried what everybody else is doing yeah yeah well, I will say that I'm glad you raised your hand um, to to my post on Polywork to come on my pack, podcast and, and talk to us about real estate. You know, I've learned a lot. Um, that's been great. 
the great thing about these podcasts is because I've just been learning just a ton of information about just a lot of different stuff and getting other people's perspective on a lot of different things. So definitely a big thanks. And, you know, hopefully I can have you back on sometime in the future. Cause I feel like you got a lot, a lot more that you could talk. About. I had a blast. I always, unfortunately, I always have a lot to talk about. I have tendency to run my mouth more than I probably <laughs> should, and I'm also opinionated. Um, and I, and I, I do have, you know, I am passionate about certain things, and I, I think it's important to be that way. Uh, like I said, I had a great time. I would love to to come back. Uh, anybody out there that's listening, like I said, more than willing to reach out and ask me a question or talk to me. Uh, funny enough, I, I did a podcast recently that went out to a to a bunch of mortgage people, and I didn't even realize it had been sent over there. And I had several folks on Facebook reach out to me, you know, or find me on Facebook and reach out and go, hey, I really liked your point about this and that. And that felt really cool. It's a good feeling to know that, you know, even if you're just getting one little nugget from somebody's information, regardless of whoever's podcast it is, I think that's important. And it's always important to keep learning. So like I said, I had a blast. I would love to come back and, and anytime you need me, no big deal. Yeah, I'll definitely be staying in, in touch. Um, so yeah, like I said, I, I know I can just tell you got a, a, a lot to talk about. Um, and you know, we don't have to necessarily just talk about all things um, um, real estate. Maybe we could have a, a 80s Dude, podcast we could do old so. school hip hop cat <laughs> hip hop cast the whole nine yards. When I got to meet uh yeah. DJ EFN and the drunk champs guys, we started talking about the Lady of Rage because she came from uh Farmville, Virginia. Remember the Lady of Rage? She had the Afro Puff song back in the day. I rock Rothen stuff. I think I, I rock Rothen stuff song. with my Afro yeah. Puffs. Two dogs all oh, day yeah, 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 yeah. above the rim soundtrack. <laughs> she was actually supposed to be the first a uh, full-fledged rapper that came out of death row, believe it or not. And then when Snoop Dogg took off, they mm. started going with the dog pound and all of that. So the biggest problem with her was by the time they finally released her CD, they death row was basically done and dead at that point. But if you ever get a chance to listen to her, that oh. one and only solo album that she put out, it's phenomenal. And she never got the due that she was supposed to get, but it was cool because I'm sitting there hanging mm. out with this, you know, the Drunk Champs podcast is huge and I'm hanging out with, you know, with them talking about, you know, my neck of the woods and old school rappers and stuff like that. And it's just, you know, when else am I going to get a chance to do that? That's just fun, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's one of those, definitely one of those like once in a lifetime exactly. experiences. So I made a tweet on, on on Twitter and they, I think they liked it and, and reposted the um, the tweet, so. They're all that good dudes, cool. and they, those but guys have worked hard to get where they are, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. The podcast is good. I, oh, yeah. I love the podcast. Um, it's dope. Yeah. So, well, I'll let you get back to the rest of your night, and I'm going to go and try to find me with one of those steaks, <laughs> no salad. Good deal. I think I'm going to go <laughs> and uh, say goodnight and go to bed, probably. <laughs> all righty. <laughs> Well, thanks again for uh, coming on the show and talking to me and the listeners. And um, yeah, take care. I'll, awesome. I'll talk to I look you forward soon. to it, my friend. You too. All right. Bye. Have a good night.